Well, this morning, I'm going to uh, continue with uh, the message from last week. And the title is How to Deal with the Guilt and Shame of Sin. I want to begin this morning in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning with verse 54. And it reads there, So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. And here's the part I want you to see. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory. The sting of death is sin. The sting is like a snake bite. You know, if you're bit by a snake, you might have been bit by a snake. I actually know a guy that was bit by a snake because he used such wisdom that he saw a copperhead in the middle of the road and thought he would try to catch it. Well, it just didn't go well for him. Let's just put it that way. But whenever you get bit, you have the initial bite or sting or uh, pain uh, of that bite. But then also it injects venom, poison, into your system. And you will see a manifestation of that bite. Just like we see the manifestation of sin uh, in, in our lives that carries on until we remove that from our system. Amen? So, uh, it says in verse 56, the sting of death is sin. And then it goes on to say, verse 56, and the strength of, the, the strength of sin is the law. I will talk to you about that for just a moment this morning. The power of sin comes from the law. Why do, you th uh, why do we think about sin? Because there are laws, right? Uh, the law is like a speed limit sign. You know, you're driving along at 60 miles an hour, and all of a sudden you see a speed zone sign that says 35. All of a sudden, your transgression is manifested. All of a sudden, you see uh, your, your transgression. You realize you're doing something you should not be doing. You're breaking the law. And in Galatians 3.24, I don't think I wrote that one down for you back there, but in Galatians 3.24, it, it says uh, the law was our uh, uh, schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. In other words, the law is there uh, as our schoolmaster, our tutor, to bring us to Christ that we might be justified out by faith. The law is simply showing you your need for a Savior. Okay? And, and the law, why it says the law is the strength of sin, is because the law magnifies your sin. And you are able to see your sin because of the law. But the law is not there to redeem you. The law is there to lead you to Jesus Christ. And through Jesus Christ, we are justified. Because of what he did on our behalf. Amen? Now, the sign isn't there. That speed sign is not there to inconvenience you. I know sometimes we think it is. Oh, man, 30 miles an hour. We ought to be able to go 45 here. What an inconvenience. It's slowing me down. No, that, that speed sign is there to help keep you safe. Amen? It's there to have a safer community. I, don't, I do not want people driving down Oak Hill at 70 miles an hour. Because, you know, my little winter is going to be old enough someday to be out in the front yard. And if she starts running for the street, if a car is going 30, there's a lot less chance they're going to hit her than if they're going 70. Amen? So, laws are there to keep our community safe. They're not there to give us a hard time. And as long as we uh, obey the law, we have no fear of the law. Amen? It's whenever you disobey the law. I remember when I was a teenager, I'd be driving along and I'd see a policeman. And we automatically say, cop. 
You might remember those days? I mean, you know, you just have to say it because you're probably doing something you shouldn't be doing. I, I don't remember, unless I do it as a joke, the last time I saw policemen said, Cheryl, come. <laughs> because I obey the law now. Amen? So I don't have to fear the law because I am a law-abiding citizen. So I'm no longer afraid uh, of the policemen. I know they're there to keep our community safe. So in like manner, God established some rules for the good of mankind. He made some rules like, oh, uh, thou shalt not murder. That sounds like a pretty good idea to me, amen? I'm kind of glad he put that out there. I mean, I'm glad we don't just go around thinking it's okay to murder one another. No, God said you shouldn't do that, and that's a law that we need to abide by, amen? Uh, he also made some other laws. He said, uh, thou shalt not steal. I like that one too. And if somebody finds somebody in my garage trying to take something, you know, I'm going to let them know they're a lawbreaker real quick. Amen? And uh, these laws are established to keep peace in the community. But uh, the law reveals your sin. Basically, that's all the law does. It reveals your sin. And some say, well, you know, that's the Old Testament. We're no longer under the law. Now, we're not under the law for justification, but God did not do away with the Ten Commandments just because Jesus came. The rules are still there, but we just do not trust in the rules for our salvation. We trust in Jesus Christ. And again, that's the whole reason for the law is to point you to Christ, to point you to your need for a Savior. So, let's look at a couple of New Testament verses. So the law said you shouldn't kill. Well, Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 through 22, it said, You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. But listen to what Jesus says. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of judgment. So in other words, Jesus didn't come and take something away. He really added more to it, didn't he? He said, it said you shall not hurt, but if, you, if you're just angry with your brother, I mean, that you have committed a sin of the heart. That's what he's saying. But thank God He's there for justification for that as well. Amen. Verse 27 of Matthew 5. You have heard it said of old, you should not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So in other words, Jesus did not come and sugarcoat anything, did He? Jesus came and said, look, and I think the point he's trying to make is this. You cannot trust in your own works for salvation. You have to trust in what he did for you. But that still does not take away the rules. It still doesn't. He came to fulfill the law, not to take the law away. God took the time to let us know what he wants. He wants us to love one another. He wants us to be kind to one another. He wants us to pray. He wants us to share our faith. He tells us not to steal. He tells us not to lie. He tells us not to commit adultery. Why does He give us these rules? He does so because He wants us to have a higher quality of life. Nowadays, people hate to hear about rules. I tell you, church, we live in a rebellious generation. People hate to hear about rules. We want to do it our way. And church, that's why our prisons and jails are overcrowded today because people have learned to do it their own way. They don't want to be told what to do. I'll do what I want to do. I don't care what the law says. I don't care what my parents say. I don't care what the teacher says. <coughs> you know, you better give your kids some rules. And you better enforce those rules. I'll tell you what you'll end up doing. You'll end up spending your Saturday afternoons visiting them in jail. God has given us rules to live by, but He knows that there are going to be times that we'll break the rules. We're kind of like God's spiritual teenagers. You know, we gave our kids rules to live by. And on a few occasions, they broke those rules. Now, we were blessed because, as far as I know, there were a limited amount of times 
that they broke the rules. When they did break the rules, were we disappointed? Yes. Definitely, we were disappointed when our kids broke the rules. Did we want them to be sorry for what they did? Yes, we did. We wanted them to be sorry for what they did. Did we want them to confess their faults? Yes, we did want them to confess their faults. Did we want them to stay sorry? No. Once they realized what they did and were sorry about it and uh, you know, made a decision not to do it again, we wanted them to put it behind them. Amen. We didn't remind them for months, you know what you did a month ago? You know what you did a year ago? No, it was done. Did we want them to change directions and not do it again? Of course. Did we love them any less? Not a bit. The Bible tells us that God loved us while we were yet enemies. In Romans 5, verse 10, it reads, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. If He loved us while we were His enemies, is He going to reject us now that we're trying to serve Him? I don't think so. Scientists tell us that teenagers are brain dead. Well, maybe not brain dead. <laughs> but they are a bit haywire. I mean, that's a scientific fact. Teenagers' brains are hay I'm sorry, teenagers. It's just a scientific fact. Your brains are haywire. When I was a teenager, my brain was haywire. It's not fully developed yet. You will see things differently when you turn 26 to 30 than you did whenever you were 16, 17, 18, and so forth. I guarantee it. Just wait. You don't believe me? Just wait. You'll see things different. That's because your brain is not fully developed. I'm not saying you're dumb. I'm just saying you're, sometimes you are. <laughs> but your brain is not fully developed yet. So whenever you do something stupid, you can say, well, my excuse is my brain's not developed. As an adult, you say, what's your excuse? That's, that's, what I, that's what I tell Cheryl. You know, I said, you know, I did a lot of stupid things when I was a teenager. I did. I did a lot of stupid things. You know, I was, I was in the drugs, I was in the drinking, I was doing this and doing that. I said, at least I had the excuse I was a teenager. I quit all that when I turned 18. Well, it's because I got saved, God delivered me and set me free. But I quit all that when I was 18. I look at people in their 30s and 40s doing that same stuff. I am like it. What's your excuse? Why would you be acting like this at your age? You need to be a grown up. You're still acting like your brain's messed up. It should be developed by the time you're 35. Amen? All right. Well, you see, God knows that our brains are a bit haywire as well because they're not completely renewed yet. God's still working on it. We should be still working on it. Amen? It tells us in Romans chapter 12 and I believe it's verse 2 to be renewed or be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We are in that process of renewing our minds. The problem is some Christians just don't take the time and effort to renew their minds. So they may be in the Lord for 10, 20 years, but still acting like uh, spiritual, rebellious teenagers. God has made provision. He accepts us. He loves us. Even when we sometimes break the rules. So does that mean I should not worry about the rules and live any way that I want to? No. Definitely not. Amen. The rules that He gives us are to let us know what He wants. That's what they are. They're saying, here's what I want. And you know, if, I, if you tell your kids to be home uh, uh, at 10 p.m., they know what you want. They know you want them to be home by 10 p.m. If you do not tell them to be home at a certain time, and they come home at 11 and you jump down the throat, why weren't you home at 10? Well, I didn't know. You see, the law is the strength of sin. Amen. They would say, I didn't know you wouldn't be home by 10. I believe his rules are a blessing. Some people are, God doesn't have any rules nowadays. Yes, he does. We just don't depend on those rules for our salvation. We don't depend on keeping those rules. 
and being saved because of that. We realize the world shows our need for a Savior when we depend upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe the law is good in that sense. He tells us what He expects, but at the same time, He's kind, gracious, and He's full, full of mercy. That's the good news. In Romans chapter 6, verse 1, it says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And then the answer to that is no. In other words, if God's so gracious and so full of mercy, and I'm depending upon Him for my justification, does that mean I can just go ahead and sin and do what I want? And he says, no. God forbid He said, that you would even think such a thought. <clears throat> Certainly not, verse 2 of chapter 6. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? God has given us a power to overcome. Will we make mistakes? Probably. But thank God, even when we make mistakes, just like a parent doesn't uh, quit loving their kid, God doesn't quit loving us, and God is there to help us and pick us back up and shake the dust off and help us go right along. Amen? In James chapter 2, verse 13, it reads, For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Now here's the part I really like. We need to remember this. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. First of all, church, we need to be merciful to ourselves. Grace abounds even in our own lives. Sometimes it's a lot easier to forgive somebody else than it is to forgive yourself. But mercy begins at home. Amen? If you mess up, God's grace will minister to you. Enjoy His goodness. And enjoy His grace. Realize others have the same issues or, or similar issues that you have. We're to walk in, the, in His goodness, sharing uh, His love, and sharing His grace and His forgiveness and His mercy with one another. You know, we're not going to go around blasting fellow believers with a rule book. Informing each other. Let me tell you what your faults are, Mike. So a lot of people like to do that. How, how is that we uh, we judge others by their actions? We judge ourselves by our intentions. You know, we, we, we need to have some mercy and grace to, to think about maybe their heart's in the right place. Maybe they're just being weak at this moment. Amen. However, that doesn't mean we're never to confront others concerning their sin. You know, sin is not without consequences. And if we love our brothers and sisters, uh, we will confront them and attempt to restore them. You see, it's all about our motivation. It's all about our motives. Why are we confronting that person? Is it because we just won't let them know what they're doing wrong? Or is it because we're concerned about them, we've been praying for them, and we want to help them to get out of that situation, out of that bondage that they're in? We're to show mercy to others. And we're, we're to show mercy to ourselves. Because, remember this verse, mercy triumphs over judgment. Amen? Amen. Let's, let's pray. Uh, Father, we are so thankful today for your grace and for your mercy. Lord, I know that sometimes as your children, it's our desire to, to serve you and to please you and to do what we know that you ask of us, which is our reasonable service. Lord, we know that sometimes we mess up. We're just so thankful that you never give up on us. You never stop loving us. That you're always there to encourage us and to show mercy and grace. Father, we just thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, that uh, your grace is abundant. And Lord, we do, not, we do not want to take your grace for granted. But Lord, we do want to extend mercy to others as you have extended mercy to us. And Lord, we thank you most of all for sending your son Jesus to 
to make all this possible. To fulfill the law and to offer us the free gift of salvation. We are so thankful for that great gift that you offer to us freely. Every head bowed and every eye closed just for a moment. If there be anyone here today and you're not sure about your relationship with Christ, but you want to be sure, I want to ask you just to lift your hand very quickly and put it right back down. I want to pray with you that you can leave this place knowing that you have a relationship with Jesus, that He is indeed your Savior, and that heaven is your home. Is there anybody this morning? I'm assuming everybody knows Christ, but I just wanted to give that opportunity. I want to encourage you. You go ahead and look at me now. I want to encourage you to go out this week with this prayer. Lord, I pray that you'll give me an opportunity to share Christ. Give me the wisdom to know what to say and the boldness to say. Amen. Last night we showed the movie Left Behind with uh, Nicolas Cage. And, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was a good movie. And, uh, you know, the, the thought is, you know, sometimes we don't, you know, we don't think about the rapture. Sometimes, you know, we, we just kind of quit talking about the rapture. But you know the rapture can happen at any moment. At any moment. And then, not too late to go to heaven, but it's sure a rough way to get there. Because I, from my understanding of the Bible, there are seven years of tribulation following the rapture. Now, I know there's a lot of folks out there have a lot of different ideas, and, and, but that's my understanding. And, uh, you know, I, I heard a person say one time, uh, uh, prepare for post-trib, pray for pre-trib. Amen. <laughs> so, uh, uh, I, I do believe we'll go first. I believe that kind of goes along with God always delivered His people before judgment came. And uh, so uh, therefore, there's a lot of reasons I believe that. But, um, you know, it's, but what if it did happen? You know, what if it did happen? Maybe you had the option to say something to somebody. You, know, you need to say it. Amen? And maybe they'll make a decision. Well, you know, even if the rapture doesn't happen, you never know when somebody's life is going to be. They could walk out there and get hit by a car or, you know, uh, anything. Freak accident could happen. And, and uh, I mean, I know they used to have altar calls. And I'm not saying they're all bad, but, you know, you may walk out of here and be your last time, last chance. Well, that's true. Every day, that's true. You never know. But at the same time, you know, His grace is here right now. And so if you feel that unction this week, tell somebody about Jesus. Amen. And not only for that drastic uh, of an illustration, but just because they need a relationship with Him. Amen. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I think I could, but I know I raised my hand. You know, I have never, from day one, regretted my decision for Christ. <clears throat> so, and, and, and pretty much every Christian, unless they're just going through a thing, uh, have said the same thing. I've never regretted that decision. That speaks volumes in itself. Now, I know some people <clears throat> get disillusioned sometimes in different ways, but whenever they really come back to themselves, you know, they'll say the same thing. I haven't regretted having a relationship with Jesus. So I want to encourage you again. Let me say that again. Pray for an opportunity to share Jesus. Pray for the wisdom to know what to say and the boldness to say it. Amen? So keep that in mind, and uh, I believe God will give you a divine opportunity. And somebody, and there's, there's, there's no feeling like the feeling of somebody accepting Christ. Awesome. Uh, God bless you, and uh, if not before, we'll see you uh, next Sunday. We're going to talk, I believe, about forgiveness next Sunday.